Well, here's, here's, here's the, the next big move. We got the story from CNBC. Spotify CEO apologizes to staff for Joe Rogan controversy as episodes get removed. The CEO said that it was Joe who pulled the episodes, and they've gone on to announce that they will be investing, where is this thing, $100 million. The CEO of Spotify said they will invest $100 million for the licensing, development, and marketing of music and audio content from historically marginalized groups. I don't know exactly what that means, but I can tell you this. If Spotify takes $200 million and gives 100 to Joe Rogan and 100 to historically marginalized groups, on the surface, I could care less. More speech is better. More speech is good. The problem is we're not getting more speech. Joe Rogan is conceding and apologizing and bending the knee and changing his positions. And the woke left is getting a massive influx of cash. So this is not more speech. It's the same old establishment talking points. And the one show, there's a reason why it's so big, Joe Rogan's show, the, the, one, the one show with a big enough footprint that actually moved the needle that discusses anti-establishment talking points is bending the knee, even if it's only a little bit. So we are not gaining in this. A lot of people pointed out when Joe said, I'll try my hardest to have, you know, if I have one person that's controversial, I'll have another expert following him. It's like, oh, okay. So the establishment mainstream media, which controls billions of views per month that everyone's already seen, and the one guy, the one time he gets a chance to speak out like Dr. Robert Malone on this audience, you're going to give the establishment the rebuttal when they already own the entire narrative. I think the good... It's not a win. The tactic is to have them on together, Sanjay and Malone, and then the truth will come out. Well, and Rogan can be the, hold the microphone. Some, some people have said, you know, every, all these, all these you know, people are absolutely right. Joe should not be platforming misinformation. Dr. Fauci should go on his show for three hours and explain everything in detail. Mm, wouldn't that I, be wonderful? Really? And then, and then in six months, that'll be misinformation. It'll have to take it down. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's the thing. That's what Joe literally said in the first video he made. That a lot of the stuff that Dr. Uh, Malone and, and, and McCullough talked about a year ago would get you banned for. So he's not going to stop. Then what happens is these activists resurface a really old video, a compilation of out of context clips. And Joe said he felt bad about it and he apologized for it. The issue is there's two fundamentally different worldviews. Joe is clearly of the worldview that we occupy, that there are certain contexts where describing things is okay. The other worldview claims that Joe used the slur simply by uttering its word in a descriptive context. Joe does not occupy that worldview, although he's claiming now he understands it and agrees with them. Does he really agree with them or is he scared of them? Because I'll be completely honest. I completely will openly admit I recognize there are conversations you can't have. You will get banned outright. Joe is coming out and saying basically that same thing. That's why I'm kind of like, oh, you know, I kind of get it, I guess. I, I get it. I used mean humor when I was a kid. It was kind of a part of our friend group. And we would call each other really abusive names and like race, be racist and all this gross stuff. And then I learned somewhere in college, I went to theater school and it was very liberal. Homosexuality was present. And I learned like, you can't just make fun of people because of the, of the way they are. And I stopped doing it. And man, has my life become better. I, I don't have crap. For the most part, anything like, like I haven't done the racist, the the, the hate, hateful, not that it's hateful comedy, but the I haven't made people edgy. the butt of my jokes since since I was 2001 or something. Edgy comedy was all the rave in the 90s and 2000s. And now it's just comedy is forbidden, man. Well, I mean, it's interesting, too, because especially in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, all of the edgy comedy was being done by left-wing people who were trying to promote a left-wing message. And on some level, I think that's why they were so successful in the culture war at that time. I think there's a simple solution to all of this. For one, look, Joe's got a really big show, and that's why this news is getting so much attention. Everyone is talking about it. It's getting bigger. Joe's apology video made the story substantially larger. His second apology made it even larger. It's not going to go away unless or until, you know, uh, the, the story is not going to stop until Joe's show is gone for whatever reason, either pulled off or he quits because, you know, they want him, the, the political establishment. They want him gone before the midterms. They can't have him propping, you know, these voices or anything like that. But I think None of this, in the end, is, is really going to matter. You know what matters? Infrastructure. Infrastructure. One of, the, one of the challenges we face is that we use YouTube for one of our you know, key pieces of infrastructure, the live portion of the show. A lot of people have pointed out that we should use Rumble. It's true. The issue is Rumble is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the audience that YouTube has. And while a lot of people have said, so what? Just do Rumble anyway. I don't think people realize that I would say maybe like 70% of the people who watch this show are not super politically active people. 
They don't know what Rumble is. They won't watch Rumble. They'll just be confused one day as to why this show is gone. That's all they'll know. It's gone. And I think it's against terms of service of YouTube if we run like an ad from 8 to 10 on YouTube that says come to the Rumble stream. Like they don't. You can't do that. It's against terms of service to tell people to go off site. There's clever things people do where they'll they'll stream for a minimum amount of time and then announce they're doing a stream somewhere else. But if you like, YouTube has a rule that if you announce you're streaming somewhere else and then leave, they, it's a bannable offense. Yeah. Outright ban your whole channel. Also, you have to think about why YouTube and Google are implementing a lot of these different censorship censorship strategies. And the reason is because left-wing activists complain to them and say things like, you're allowing this person on this platform. And often they'll say, you're allowing people to be radicalized by this specific person on this platform. Someone who's come to YouTube for reasons that are totally non-political will see a Tim Pool video or a Freedom Tunes video or a Crowder video and they will get sucked down this deep, dark rabbit hole. Now, what the person is really saying is that other ideas are being given a voice on this platform and I don't like that. For our response to be, you know what, then we're just going to get off their platform and give them exactly what they want is in some ways for us to admit defeat. Yeah, it's like there's a big battlefield and, you know, the ranks are being flattened. So we yell, retreat, let's go, seed the battlefield. It's and, and it's true. I mean, eventually, yeah, YouTube could ban each and every one of our channels. And I think it's important to have a contingency plan uh, for if and when that happens. But the fact that the left wing is out there saying they're on YouTube and that's bad makes me very much want to stay on YouTube because I want to do the things that the left thinks are terrible. So there's a couple things to say. One, this is why we have TimCast.com. So we can host, you know, conversations in our quote unquote speakeasy. But the other thing I'll say is if someone is, here's what I tell people. They're like, hey, I want to get started doing a podcast or whatever. I'm like, do it on Rumble. Don't start on YouTube. Rumble has for new channels, in my opinion, an opportunity for growing an audience faster than YouTube does. Mm and an opportunity for a style of content that is greatly missing in the market. I started making YouTube videos as content and censorship was getting worse and worse and worse. Here we are with with a big platform and a lot of people who watch. So I think it's important to maintain, but we do post everything to Rumble as well. And for TimCast.com, we use Rumble infrastructure. If you're starting a new channel, look at Dan Bongino. Dan Bongino had 2 million subscribers on Rumble and only like 700 or 800,000 on YouTube. So if you're starting a new channel, I would say start it on Rumble. And we've talked about this too. If you want to do comedy, you can really do comedy on Rumble. The links can be shared. Then ultimately what it comes down to is it's not about Joe. It's not about any individual. It's about infrastructure. It's about the ability of individuals to freely speak without without having to uh, to worry about being banned. So in the event we ever did get banned, oh yeah, we'd immediately be on, you know, Rumble most likely. But, uh, you know, they're not perfect either. We'd still operate much the same way. And, you know, we probably just carry on. But there'd be a lot of people who would be genuinely confused as to what happened to the show. They, you know, YouTube will probably lose some viewership. But, man, I got to tell you, when we are sick or we have a cancellation and so the show doesn't happen, we can post about why it doesn't happen everywhere. And we still get emails from people saying, like, where's the show? I even get Facebook messages from family, like, where's the show? And I'm like, man, we literally posted on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube. Like, we posted all over the place. And People don't see it. They just turn on the TV at 8, turn it off at 10, basically. A lot of people tell me they turn on their TV, open the YouTube app, and then watch the show live on their TVs. And we've also seen a whole bunch of images. That was really funny. I think Luke, it was Luke, he was browsing Amazon. You remember this? Yeah, yeah. He was browsing Amazon looking at TVs to buy. And one of the TVs had a product description, like photos. And the photo was us on the TV. It was really, really funny. So meta. So so anyway, look, the the point is, we're, we're, we're beholden to YouTube for a lot of ways. But... I like to imagine that we have we have extended some kind of bridge from YouTube to Rumble to to BitChute to Gab to Minds to any other of these other platforms where people can still communicate and share. So my advice is anyone starting new channels, Rumble is your opportunity, not YouTube. I'm very interested in integrating Minds and Rumble. It's it's on the talking table right now. I've been hanging out with Chris and Bill, and I'm I'm like obsessed with this. I want to put it together. I want to bring Andrew. Come on in, buddy. I know over there, Gab. I see you. Uh, I love you, Andrew. I think integrating Gab, Minds, and uh, Rumble and Library is so key and right there in front of us. Very excited. Well, that's like one of the things we do is we like, you know, the candidates that we work with and a lot of the, uh, you know, organizations we work with are, you know, the big tech censorship is a very important issue to them. And so, like, when we work with a candidate, we want to steer, like, we want to steer them towards, you know, when we get this new GOP majority, we actually have to do something, change laws in Congress that can prevent big tech from sense from politically motive from doing politically motivated censorship 
And, you know, because of the lobbying budgets they have, that's why it's never been done. Because a lot of, you know, unfortunately, it's a lot of Republicans who take money from these companies and then laws are never changed and the censorship continues. Is there a way to get that money out of politics? Uh, well, no, no, because we have citizens because we have the Citizens United case where corporations are considered people and they have free speech. So, you know, there are campaign finance laws like the FEC has like laws, but, you know, there are ways like there are ways around it just as there are ways around, you know, billion like rich people when they pay their taxes. Yeah. So we yeah. have to repeal. What, what was it called? Uh, Citizens United. That's the name of the Supreme Court case. But, you know, it's a Supreme Court case. overturn. It. It's very tough to repeal that. A yeah, it's a, it's a it's a precedent basically allows super PACs to spend it money. comes yeah. from way back in the 1800s. A guy, a really rich guy wanted to run for president, had all this money. He was like, why can't I use my own money on my own campaign? I want to take a train around the U.S. And they're like, he's kind of making a good point. And that was the first step of like, hey, rich guy gets to do politics yeah. a little easier. And yeah. So they start passing laws to kind of aid the wealthy after that. Yeah. But I mean, the, I, what I think is that the GOP has changed a lot on the issue of big tech. And I think we're starting to see them get a lot more serious, you know, with, with on that issue. And I, you know, when we get this new GOP majority in this new midterm election, that should be, that's, that's an issue they need to focus on. Yeah. Sure. They talk about breaking up big tech. I don't think yeah. you can break up the corporation. That's why I talk about freeing the software code of big social yeah. networks. I wonder if it's too fascist to order the government to, but it's kind of like breaking up a monopoly. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. our antitrust law is fascist. I don't think so. They're like anti-fascist. Yeah it, yeah, it depends on who you ask, I guess. Look, I think I think if you're like a liber, I mean, I th I would say most libertarians would be against that sort of thing. But I would mm -hmm. say, as you know, I, as somebody on the as a conservative, as somebody, I distrust. If you distrust, you know, concentrated power in the government, you should also distrust concentrated power in corporations. And I think one of the things people on the right you know miss today is that government today is is not the only threat to our liberty corporations that get too big can be just as big of a threat and even more of a threat like what would you say is a bigger threat to your freedom today the government or google yeah no exactly google mm -hmm. yeah that's wild the military uh, uh, concerns me but a corporation can hire private military basically it can have armed security and then if they want to flick a switch and go psycho you're like well glad we have a government to protect us Thanks for checking out this segment from the TimCast IRL podcast. If you want to watch live, you can check out this channel Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to this channel. And if you want more unfiltered and uncensored content with all of these guests, go to TimCast.com and become a member. All of these guests you know and love in exclusive segments on our website where we are unrestricted in what we talk about so you'll definitely not want to miss it. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you all next time.